Welcome everybody to Hearers of the Word, weekly scripture notes for Sunday number 24 in Year C. Our program begins with Lost and Found. Then we're going to read the full text of the Gospel, 15, 1 to 32. We'll notice the sources used and then attempt a commentary. After that, I'm going to ask a general question. What is it about? Some conclusions and a prayer. In this Gospel, we manage to hear three favourite parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The first two are relatively easy to understand. They're all part of the offer of grace to all without discrimination. The third parable, although familiar, is a bit more tricky. The simple pattern established in the first two parables is broken by the elder brother story. And interestingly, the parable at the end is unfinished and open-ended. We're not told what happens next. So we come to the Gospel text, beginning with the setting in Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. 
for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The parable of the lost coin and the parable of the prodigal son are both unique to Luke. But Luke shares with Matthew the parable of the lost sheep. So this comes from the saying source, the Q sayings. So on this slide we have the Matthew version of the lost sheep, the Luke version, and in the middle the probable reconstruction of the Q version of the parable. The important thing from our point of view is to notice the editorial adjustments of Luke. He gives a heading, so he told them this parable, but he adds verses 6 and 7, giving particular Lucan notes to the parable. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And very frequently in Luke's Gospel, there is emphasis on joy and rejoicing. And then Luke adds verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And you can almost hear the inverted commas around righteous persons, these people who seem to need no repentance. This chapter is easy to map because of the clarity of the distinct stories. The context in Luke is 15, 1 to 2. And then we have the power of the lost sheep, the power of the lost coin, and the parable of, in some ways, the lost sons, because both sons are, in different ways, lost. The second two parables, as just noted, are in Luke only. It is relatively unlikely that either the lost coin or the prodigal son goes back to Jesus. Very unlikely, I would say, in the case of the prodigal son. It reads like a Lucan creation. And the context is also created by Luke and guides our interpretation within the setting of the gospel itself. The extra material in Luke, not found anywhere else, goes under the siglum L for Luke. And here's a list of the Lucan parables, the special story parables in Luke's gospel. The two debtors, the good Samaritan, the friend at midnight, the rich fool, the barren fig tree, the tower builder and warring king, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the dishonest steward, the rich man and Lazarus, the servant's duty, the widow and the unjust judge, the Pharisee and the tax collector. And as you will have noticed, some of the most easily remembered and most striking parables are in Luke's special source.
The narrative parables in L, Luke's special source, show the following features. Concern for the, the poor, the oppressed and the marginalised, including women. The consequent excoriating of the wealthy and the powerful who do not help the poor. The power of the prayer and petition of the marginalised. The unearned forgiveness offered to sinners. The danger of neglecting this offer by refusing to repent. And the encapsulation of most of these themes within the theme of the inclusion of the Gentiles in the people of God, prefigured in the Gospel and realised in Acts. One need only peruse the list of L parables to appreciate how much they are steeped in and give voice to these redactional editorial concerns of Luke. These notably Lucan theological themes in the parables unique to him are often matched and reinforced by vocabulary, grammar, literary form and style that are typical of Luke. A prime example of such Lucan stylistic traits is the developed inner monologue unique to L parables within the synoptic corpus, and we will see it in The Prodigal Son. So we begin at chapter 15, verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. The context is created by Luke and is the context of the inclusive offer of the gospel to all without distinction. This echoes real issues from the ministry of Jesus, but also, of course, real issues of the inclusion of the Gentiles at the time of the writing of the gospel. So we come first to the parable of the lost sheep. And I'm going to notice the Greek word for lost and losing uh, throughout. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing apolesas, one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost, apolos, until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost, Apollos. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who have no need of repentance. So the image of shepherd is a traditional one from the Old Testament, familiar from Psalm 23 and Ezekiel. The pattern of lost and found is established, a pattern to be repeated in the next two parables. Joy is a great theme in Luke, and he underlines there will be more joy over one sinner who converts, who repents. And Luke is being a little ironic here over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Who on earth are these people who need no conversion of heart? The second parable. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses Apolese, one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost, Apollesa. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So this parable features a woman, a marginalised figure perhaps in the first century, just as the shepherd would have been. The coin is a drachma, a silver coin, equivalent then to a denarius, a day's wage, so significant but not a huge amount of money. The pattern of lost found rejoicing is sustained, and the two stories set a pattern, and the third story varies the pattern very considerably. The third parable. Then Jesus said, 
there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. The younger brother is delicate because he leaves out the rest of the sentence. Give me the share of the property that will belong to me when you die. It's important to notice that the father shares the property between them so that when the older brother says, you never gave me anything, he's actually not telling the truth. And the preference for the younger over the older echoes a powerful theme in the book of Genesis, where you have the reversal of primogenitor, and the younger brother is always favoured. Cain, Abel, Esau, Jacob, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Luke certainly has this in mind. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to, to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. So the younger son's decline is precipitous, from family first of all, then from country, and eventually from religion. Pigs are forbidden in Judaism, being ritually unclean. And the low point is reached. He was originally full of initiative, but now the younger son has lost all sense of agency. He would have gladly filled himself, but no one gave him anything. But he came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying, Apollo me, of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. So here we have a very good example of the Lucan interior monologue. And the opening part of the sentence is important. He came to himself which is an accurate translation against the Jerusalem Bible, he came to his senses. And in our translation, the NRSV, it says, here I am dying of hunger, but the Greek has apolumi, I am being lost of hunger, meaning in this case death. But the verb is frequent in Luke. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, Apollos, and is found. And they began to celebrate. So clearly the father is anxiously waiting and sees him in the distance. The word for compassion, esplangniste, is a very important word pointing to the compassion of God in the parables. It's to be noticed that the son is not given an opportunity to finish his speech. The father interrupts him. And then he instructs his full restoration with the symbolic robe, ring and sandals. And then a celebration follows. And so far the story closely resembles the lost sheep and the lost coin. But the writer has not forgotten about the elder brother. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. 
and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this but when this son of yours came back, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. So we notice that the elder son contacts the slaves first. Somehow he feels closer to the slaves than to family members. And we notice that again the father goes out to him. In verse 29, he's not quite telling the truth because earlier on the father divided the property between them. And we notice that he refers to his brother as this son of yours, effectively denying that he was his brother. And in verse 30, he's lying here too. We didn't hear earlier about the prostitutes and they may indicate a hint at idolatry rather than sexual misdemeanor. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost, Apollos, and has been found. So first of all, the father affirms the elder brother. You are with, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. He refuses the reference, this son of yours, and calls the prodigal son, this brother of yours. And then the parable ends without an ending. We're not told what happens next. And that's a really important part of the parable's meaning. So what is this third parable about? We can begin like this. The brothers are more alike than they seem. The younger brother would like to return as a slave and the basis of relationship is servile guilt. And the elder brother already acts as a slave and the basis of his relationship is servile loyalty. And the father rejects both projections as false. And one way of reading the parable is as follows. The faithful son who stays at home and always keeps the commandments represents the Jewish people, God's first chosen people. The unfaithful son who strays from home represents all outsiders, in particular Gentiles. Both are children of the one compassionate father. And the parable is open-ended. The offer to God's first chosen people still stands. And we note that the historical Jesus did not foresee the break with Judaism which happened subsequently. And in Luke's reflection here, the influence of Paul is evident, as we shall see on the next slide. In the letter to the Romans, in chapters 9 to 11, Paul speaks about the destiny of God's first chosen people and tries to understand what happened in their non-recognition of Jesus as the Messiah. And in the final chapter of this reflection, chapter 11, he writes significantly as follows. As regards the gospel, they, the Jewish people, are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too 
may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. In other words, God's faithfulness to his first chosen people and God's offer of salvation, those things are still on the table. By the time Luke was writing, about 110 uh, AD, Christian anti-Judaism was already beginning to appear. It would appear fully in the time of Marcion in the mid-2nd century. This tendency tended to reject the Jewish roots of Christianity and wished to set aside eventually the entire Old Testament. It was as though somehow God had rejected his first chosen people, the very question asked in Romans 11.1. 1. Luke has a different program. It is the one God who has spoken to both groups and in both testaments. Instead, the Jewish roots of Christianity are affirmed and the offer to God's first chosen people still stands. That's why the power of the prodigal son ends open-endedly. A bit like the Acts of the Apostles itself, which also ends in the very last verses in an open-ended and intriguing way. He, Paul, lived there in Rome two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let us pray. Undaunted, you seek the lost, O God. Exultant, you bring home the found. Touch our hearts with grateful wonder at the tenderness of your forbearing love. Grant us delight in the mercy that has found us and bring all to rejoice at the feast of forgiveness. We make our prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody.